I'm speaking to you today from Glucksman Ireland House at New York University and I'm giving a course here, an undergraduate course uh, called Literature as History and um, this is a video summary of uh, this week's uh, talk. Um, this week I've been looking at um, the Cyclops episode in James Joyce's Ulysses which I think is a an excellent example of the, the way in which literature and history interact, the manner in which um, this episode of Ulysses gives you a powerful insight into developments in early 20th century Ireland, which led on to further evolution of Irish nationalism in the second decade of the 20th century and on to the revolutionary period after 1916. So for me at least, uh, the Cyclops episode, and Ulysses as a whole, is situated uh, in an Ireland that was on the cusp of dramatic political change. The novel is set in 1904, but of course it was written between 1914 and 1921, during and after the First World War, which forced James Joyce to move his family from Trieste, where they'd lived for the previous 10 years to Zurich, to Newton, Zurich in neutral Switzerland, in order to be able to um, live out the war in that uh, neutral city. So the First World War did impinge strongly on Joyce's life and on his family, and therefore I think that the war is in the background of the novel, even though the novel is set in the year 1904, long before, a decade before the outbreak of the First World War. It's also interesting for me as a historian that um, the, the Ulysses is set um, about halfway between the death of Parnell in 1891 and the, um, the, the Easter Rising of 1916, which began a new um, era in Irish history and led on to Irish independence in 1922, the year when Joyce's Ulysses was published in Paris, the 2nd of February, uh, on Joyce's 40th birthday. So for me, one of the appeals of Ulysses has always been the, uh, the connection it has with the history of Ireland and the insights that the novel can offer into developments in early 20th century Ireland as uh, the Parnellite generation were uh, moving on and a new generation was emerging. That new generation would eventually, and that generation was Joyce's own generation because many of the, the leaders of the Easter Rising were nearly exact contemporaries of James Joyce's, but Ireland was moving on. Um, the Parnellite generation of, um, of, Yitz, of Joyce's father, John Stanislaus Joyce, a great um, supporter of Charles Stuart Parnell, and hugely disappointed when Parnell fell from grace in 1890 and then died uh, at the age of 46 in 1891. That generation is moving on, it's in decline, and the new generation hasn't yet uh, put its head above the parapet, but would do so in the uh, decade following the, um, or the, uh, in the years during which Joyce was busy writing Ulysses. So for me at least, uh, Ulysses is in part, and it's about many, many things, of course, it's a very large book, but in part, it's uh, an elegy for this um, departing, declining generation of Joyce's father, the Parnellites, whose hopes for a home rule future for Ireland were dashed cruelly and suddenly and dramatically in 1890 when um, Parnell was named in a divorce case and ultimately was ousted as leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party. The party split and uh, didn't come back again for 10 years, but in a way never really recovered uh, the kind of powerful position it had under the charismatic leadership of uh, Charles Stuart Parnell. So um, Ulysses is, is a novel of language, it's an odyssey in language, it's an odyssey in character. You have these three very fascinating characters that Joyce explores in great detail in the novel. Leopold Bloom, his wife Molly Bloom, and then Stephen Dedalus, based on Joyce himself. And we get to know those characters better than almost any characters I can think of in modern literature because we get inside their minds. We actually hear them thinking. We hear their thoughts, their intimate thoughts, and, and they cover the whole range of their experience. So it's a novel of character. The language in the novel is constantly changing. Uh, the novel is written in so many different styles, and that's one of the reasons why it's been so difficult uh, over this last century for readers to 
to grapple with it, and many readers have found themselves frustrated by it. But for me, Ulysses is also a history novel. Uh, in the first episode of the novel, uh, you have a discussion between uh, Stephen, based on James Joyce, and uh, Haynes, who's an Englishman, who's an enthusiast for all things Irish, and uh, in this conversation, Haynes says, history is to blame for uh, the things that happened between uh, Britain and Ireland, for the, for, the, for the tragedies and the difficulties that um, were created over the centuries uh, because of British um, domination of Ireland, British rule in Ireland. So Haynes sort of regards history as something outside of life. It's a kind of a, it's a thing that's it, it's set apart. History is to blame. And then in the, in the second episode of U.S. says, um, Stephen uh, discussing um, various things with uh, the principal of the school where he's working, Mr. D.C., uh, he says, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awaken. So history is there from the very beginning as something that is, that is weighing on, on, um, on Joyce, is weighing on, on the characters in his novel. In fact, in a, a portrait of the artist of the young man, which is a kind of like a prelude almost to Ulysses, um, Stephen Dedalus um, talks about the reason why he wants to leave Ireland, left Ireland in 1904, as Joyce did, uh, was because he didn't want to be trapped by the nets of language, nationality and religion. And you can feel the influence of those nets running through USA's, especially through the Cyclops chapter. Now the Cyclops chapter abounds with history. It's essentially uh, a, a grandiose um, dis a debate about Irish national identity. And in a key moment uh, in the novel, or in the uh, chapter, the episode, uh, the episode is set, by the way, in Barney Kiernan's uh, pub on Little Britain Street, which is a very interesting place uh, for a discussion of Irish national identity, Little Britain Street. And there are various um, drinkers in the pub, um, but most notably the citizen, who's a, a rather uh, over-the-top uh, character. He's a caricature of Michael uh, Cusack, who uh, founded the GAA in 1884, was a rather um, uh, loud and, and uh, um, uh, colourful character and uh, Joyce has lots of fun in, um, in the Cyclops episode uh, portraying um, uh, Cusack as a, as, a, as a Cyclops, as a one-eyed nationalist. And, but uh, he's a very colourful character, he says very colourful things, he expresses himself in a very voluble manner and uh, people uh, in the pub are obviously uh, coming around to talk to him. There's a lot of lively discussion about uh, Irish identity and about Ireland's relations with Britain and about the British royal family and so forth. But in a key moment in the uh, episode, um, Bloom, the area Paul Bloom, who comes in to the pub looking for somebody because he wants to uh, try to organise uh, the payment of an insurance policy on his dead friend, uh, Paddy Dignam, who was buried that morning and uh, whose funeral features in the Cyclops episode earlier in the novel. So Bloom is in there for the very good reason that he wants to do a good deed for the family of his departed friend. But the drinkers in the pub, the citizen in particular, don't like Bloom, A, because they think of him as not really Irish because his background is Hungarian Jewish. Uh, is he a real Irish man or what? They have a very narrow uh, view of what an Irishman is. And eventually, uh, the citizen starts to goad Bloom, and he says to him, what is your nation, if I may ask, Mr. Bloom? And Bloom replies, Ireland, I was born here, Ireland. Now, of course, that's a definition that I think most Irish people would accept today. In fact, we'd probably say anybody who's come to live in Ireland from other parts of the world and who's become, uh, who's declared themselves to want to uh, settle and is entitled to settle in Ireland and say gets Irish citizenship, we would, I think, extend uh, the definition of, of Irish nationality to those people. So people who in the last number of years have, have taken on Irish nationality from other parts of the world, I think we would accept that they are part of the Irish nation, they've chosen to become part of the Irish nation. But in the early 20th century, um, in particular, in uh, the early years of the century, um, you had this uh, Irish Ireland uh, uh, philosophy uh, pushed in particular by 
a man called Dennis Patrick Moran, uh, DP Moran, about whom we will uh, talk in the next uh, seminar in this series. But there was a kind of a, a focus on, on Irishness as a compound of Catholicism, um, traditional uh, Irish identity, uh, the Irish language, um, part of Ireland maybe going back centuries. So a kind of a very nativist uh, definition of Irish identity was being pushed by many people in the early part of the 20th century. And Bloom pushes back against that. He, he insists that by being, uh, having been born in Ireland, uh, he is, his nation is Ireland and he, he shouldn't be regarded as some kind of outsider. But the people in the pub continue to regard him with suspicion, and not just, by the way, because of his ethnic uh, religious background, but also because he is someone uh, who is, is suspected of having backed the winner of the Ascot Gold Cup throwaway at 20 to 1. This is a misunderstanding that happens earlier in the novel, but everyone in the pub assumes that Bloom, when he goes out to try and organize the insurance policy payment for the family of his friend Paddy Dignam, they assume he's gone to collect his winnings. And when he comes back, he doesn't immediately offer to buy a drink. So they suspect that he's being mean and not sharing his good fortune with, the, with his fellow drinkers in the pub. Bloom is entirely innocent of all of this, of course, but that doesn't, um, prevent uh, the others in the pub from looking at scans, from looking in a hostile way at him. So the Cyclops episode is characterized by uh, grandiose linguistic fireworks. And here, for example, just to give you a sense of, for those who haven't read Ulysses, and you should read it, and if you don't read Ulysses, you should certainly read the Cyclops episode, which is a very lively episode indeed. And here you have a description of uh, Michael Cusack. The figure seated on a large boulder at the foot of a round tower was that of a broad-shouldered, deep-chested, strong-limbed, frank-eyed, red-haired, freely freckled, shaggy-bearded, wide-nosed, long, uh, long-nosed, long-headed, deep-voiced, bare-knee, brawny-handed, hairy-legged, ruddy-faced, sinewy-armed hero. From shoulder to shoulder he measured several L's, and his rock-like mountainous knees were covered, and his likewise the rest of his body wherever, wherever visible, with a strong growth of tawny, prickly hair in hue and toughness similar to the mountain gorse. So that is obviously a caricature. Um, Mighty Music didn't look like that, but this I think is Joyce poking fun at the tendency of nationalisms of um, of nations to exaggerate um, their own virtues. And therefore, uh, Michael Cusack is this sort of heroic uh, figure from Gaelic Ireland, having founded the GAA. It has to be um, presented in an exaggerated manner. And then uh, Joyce goes on with this list of the ancient Irish heroes and heroines of antiquity. And this list contains 99 names. And some of the names are clearly Irish, like Cú Holland and um, Brian Boru, but others uh, are anything but. Uh, you have uh, Buddha, you have Dante Alighieri, you have uh, Benjamin Franklin, the man who broke the bank at Monte Carlo, the mother of the Maccabees, uh, the last of the Mohegans, and so forth. So, and this, uh, of course, is also poking fun at the tendency of, of nationalisms to make outlandish, to make exaggerated claims for the virtues of their own nation. So in the uh, pub, in Barney Kiernan's pub on Little Britain Street, you get an extended discussion of national identity. The citizen sets out his grievances against Britain. He sets out his, his view of how Ireland should develop, uh, this um, Gaelic um, uh, country uh, needed to get away from Britain, uh, have its independence and then uh, go back to the glories of the past, which of course um, uh, Cusack, uh, the citizen, tended to exaggerate because um, those who are pressing a political case do tend to exaggerate the, uh, the virtues of what they want to go back to and they do tend to maybe overstate the, the difficulties and the disadvantages of their, you know, their current lot. But nonetheless, you do get in Cyclops, although it's over the top, although it's written in the, in the way of a caricature, a lampoon of certain attitudes, you do get a sense of maybe some of the reasons why James Joyce decided to leave Ireland because 
he, he detected, as indeed W.B. Yeats did in the early part of the 20th century, that Irish nationalism was becoming more narrowly focused, was becoming more, more openly political, that the cultural um, flowering that Yeats had tried to uh, promote in the 1880s and 90s was coming under threat because there were those who, who didn't like some of the plays that the Abbey Theatre was putting on, who disliked, for example, uh, uh, the Countess Kathleen when um, that was put on uh, in the late uh, 19th century and so forth. So you had a lot of, and then in 1907, after Ulysses is set in 1904, but 1907 you had the um, disturbances in the Abbey when the play by the Western World was put on and uh, many uh, Dubliners didn't like uh, the, the portrayal of rural Ireland by John Millington Singh in uh, the play by the Western World. So I think Joyce could detect this narrowing of focus on the part of the national tradition that he was part of growing up in the Ireland of his time. So Bloom is a, is a famously um, diffident and underspoken individual. But eventually, after he's been goaded for quite a bit of time in Barney Kiernan's pub in the Cyclops episode, he cuts loose and expresses his own views. He pushes back against the narrow-minded nationalism of those who are goading him in the pub that day. And here's how it goes. And I belong to, to a race this is Bloom, that is hated and persecuted. Also now, this very moment, this very instant. Robbed, says he, plundered, insulted, persecuted, taking what belongs to us by right. At this very moment, says he, putting out his fists, sold by auction off in Morocco like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about a new Jerusalem, says the citizen. I'm talking about injustice, says Bloom. Right, says John Wise, stand up to it then with force like a man. But it's no use, says he. Force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women. Insult and hatred. And everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that that is really life. What, says Alf? Love, says Bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. I must go now, says he to John Wise. Just around the corner uh, to the court a moment to see if Martin is there. If he comes, just say I'll be back in a second. Just a moment. Who's hindering you? And off he pops like greased lightning. A new apostle to the Gentiles, says the citizen. Universal love. Well, says John Wise, isn't that what we're told? Love thy neighbours. That chap, says the citizen. Beggar my neighbour is his motto. Love my ya. He's a nice pattern of a Romeo and Juliet. So you see there both Bloom pushing back and saying that force, hatred, history is no life for men and women. But it's the opposite of that that is really life. Love, says he. So he's, I think Joyce is, when writing that, very conscious of the hatreds that have been unleashed on the Western Front, the slaughter of the First World War. It's not just, I think, aimed at Ireland. It also reflects the time when Ulysses was written in 19, between 1914 and 1921, uh, during and after that, that dreadful conflict that um, slaughtered so many people on those dreadful battlefields. So, for me at least, Joyce, in portraying and caricaturing what he saw as a narrow-minded nationalism of early 20th century Ireland, was also conscious of the hatreds that were also running wild across the European continent when he was writing the novel. So this is a, a history novel with a focus on 1904 and a focus on the world around Joyce when he was writing his novel with the First World War in the background and also dramatic events in Ireland in the wake of 1916. And Joyce puts a little, little joke into um, Cyclops. It's essentially a comic novel and it's a, a comic episode of the novel, Cyclops in particular, can be very funny in parts. Some of the dialogue is really very, very sharp. But in one part of the novel, um, two of the characters, two of the minor characters, John Weisspower is one of them, says that Bloom, with his Hungarian Jewish background, had given Arthur Griffith the idea 
for the resurrection of Hungary. And that was a series of articles published in book form in 1904, which led on to the um, foundation of the first Sinn Féin, which um, was in favour of dual monarchy for Ireland. It was very different from the Sinn Féin of, of uh, 1960 and onwards, and indeed the Sinn Féin of today. And, of course, uh, Bloom as a fictional character couldn't have given um, the idea for, uh, for um, the resurrection of Hungary uh, to Arthur Griffith. But that is um, maybe a, a hint that Arthur Griffith, whom Bloom refers to as a coming man, by 1922, Arthur Griffith had become the president of Dáil Éireann and therefore effectively the, the head of state of the emerging independent Ireland. So you have therefore in the Cyclops chapter, while it mainly deals with uh, the Parnellite generation that were uh, moving on and being overtaken by events and would be overtaken by events in the following decade, but you have a, a hint, a reference to Arthur Griffith, one of those who was involved in the dramatic events that transformed Ireland while um, James Joyce was busy writing Ulysses in Trieste, Zurich and, and Paris. So that's um, my, my take on, on the Cyclops episode. Um, I hope that that's given you some sense of, of and maybe gives you an encouragement to go and read James Joyce's Ulysses or at least read the Cyclops episode. Um, I've also written a book on the subject uh, called Ulysses, A Reader's Odyssey, which is available from New Island Books in Dublin. But um, for me, farewell until I uh, record my next uh, video summary in a week's time. Thank you very much.